Welcome! Thank you for joining me today to study in depth the 30 Caprices Opus 107 by Siegfried Kargelert. We will weave our way through the thick technical writing and demanding musical aspects of this large composition. Kargelert wrote these Caprices to challenge the flutist in every possible way, and I find these short pieces to be precocious and daring. Playing this repertoire is an investment that you are making in your flute playing because it showcases your discipline as a flutist and your decisions and determination as a musician. I am delighted to be your teacher for these caprices and I hope that you will find a few suggestions that will be beneficial to your performance. Whether in a lesson or on the concert stage, these short caprices deserve all the energy you can bring to them. They allow us to speak in a musical language that is rare in solo flute literature. According to Mr. Carr-Gaylert, these caprices represent, quote, forming a connective link between the existing educational literature and the unusually complicated parts of modern orchestral works by Richard Strauss, Mahler, Bruckner, Rieger, Fitzner, Schillings, Schoenberg, Korngold, Schrecker, Scriabin, Stravinsky, and the most modern virtuosi soli." End quote. In 1915, Kargelert enlisted in the German army, playing oboe, horn, and saxophone in the regimental band. These caprices for flute were composed in these war years between 1915 and 1918 for his army friend and colleague, Mr. Karl Bartazot. While playing oboe in this military band, Kargelert sat next to Mr. Bartazot. As a gesture of friendship, Kargelert composed the caprices in order to give Mr. Bartazot something challenging to play. This was, perhaps, to take their minds off the hard and brutal times at war in the trenches. In his professional life, Kargelert was also a professor of organ and composition at the Conservatory of Music in Leipzig. Mr. Bartazot went on to become the solo flutist of the Gewandhaus Orchestra in Leipzig from 1918 to 1951. It is during this wartime period that Kargelert wrote most of his works for wind instruments, including these 30 caprices, the unaccompanied flute solo Sonata Appassionata, and four works for flute and piano. A caprice, by definition, is a sudden and unaccountable change of mood or behavior. In music, caprice takes on the term capriccio. In Italian word, a capriccio is a lively piece of music, typically one that is short and free in form and gets its origin from the early 17th century, denoting a sudden change of mind. As Carr Gaylert writes in his treatise Gratis ad Parnassum, Quote, in these 30 caprices, you will encounter scales in major seconds and in diatonic intervals interrupted by chromatics. You will hear broken chords of major seconds, fourths, fifths, major sevenths, and minor ninths. Suspensions, anticipations, parallel and extreme breaks of two harmonically independent parts are all the language of these difficult caprices. Some later contributors to the caprices have written that there are mistakes. I have found only a few discrepancies. I have found, in accordance with the practices developed in the early 20th century, that accidentals do not carry through the octave. Sometimes they do not carry within the measure. Be careful to review your key signatures. Look for measures loaded with accidentals and leaping notes, paying particular attention to the octaves. There are some exceptions to these rules, and in my errata notes, I will explain each discrepancy as I address each individual caprice. Carr Gaylert is adamant. He writes, quote, it was far from my intention to write a work that lies easily in the fingers. On the contrary, the student must learn what does not lie easily. The difficult will always grow easy by overcoming the more difficult." End quote.
It is a pleasure to be here in Ann Arbor exploring Siegfried Kargelert's groundbreaking work for flute. Siegfried Kargelert performed an organ recital in Ann Arbor in 1932, and according to his daughter, Katharina Schwab, quote, his last great joy was his tour of America. As a flutist, it was through studying and performing his 30 caprices that I was inspired to learn all I could about Siegfried Kargelert, the man in his music. It is my hope that the following will shed light on his uniquely technical and expressive writing for the flute. Siegfried Kargelert, born in southern Germany in Schwabenland in 1877, was the youngest of 12 children. His given name was Siegfried Theodor Karg, but as a young adult, he altered both his first name and his surname. When he was very young, his family moved to Leipzig, where he eventually studied composition with Karl Reinecke. In looking at a copy of Kargelert's teacher certificate, notice Reinecke's signature at the bottom as director of the conservatory. Note also the listing of some of Kargelert's student compositions, such as an oboe sonata, a trio for piano and string instruments, four songs for soprano, and a piano concerto. In 1904, with Karl Reinecke's kind help, Kargelert became acquainted with Edvard Grieg. As his mentor, Grieg advised Kargelert to concentrate on composition and recommended him to several publishers. He also advised him to spell his name the Nordic way, Siegfried, to avoid any suspicion of Jewish origin. Actually, Kargelert's father was a strict Catholic and his mother was a genuinely rooted Lutheran. Grieg encouraged Kargelert to make a thorough study of all the masters of composition. Consequently, he composed Stilstudien, which we know as 33 portraits for harmonium. This is a collection of 33 pieces in all styles, ranging from Palestrina to Schoenberg, including a musical portrait of Grieg and Kargelert. This was around the time that Kargelert went through an artistic crisis. He began to distance himself from his earlier influences, such as Scriabin and Schoenberg. Describing his new style, he wrote, I began again in C major and prayed to the muse of melody. A striking passage from a letter written by the composer describes the conditions under which his famous 66 chorale improvisations were written and at the same time throws a revealing light on the composer's attitude to his art. I had made up my mind, he said, to make a pilgrimage to the source of all music, Bach. It was at this time I experienced the most exalted hours of my life. I heeded not whether it was morning, midday, evening, or night. I read, read, read the Old and New Testaments and our hymns, and composed without ceasing for a whole year. Only a twentieth part could in fact be recorded. Unrecorded things vanished forever, like fortunes and dreams. The pieces were not the product of labored craftsmanship and ingenuity. I did not work upon them, rather I just wrote down what inspiration brought. In 1919, Kargelert succeeded Max Rager as head composition teacher at the Leipzig Conservatory. He is primarily known for his more than 250 works for organ. He also wrote numerous pieces for winds, strings, and voice. His works for flute were written between the years 1912 and 1922 and represent his highly individual and mature style. In the left column is the list of works that are published, and in the column to the right is a list of lost or unpublished works. Evidence of performances of several of these lost or unpublished works can be found in the program booklets at the Leipzig Conservatory of Music. It is unfortunate that much of Kargelert's flute music was not published during his lifetime. In a letter to his students, Kargelert wistfully states, Our biggest publishers have material enough to last for years and are only in need of money. In February 1933, Kargelert suffered his first stroke and later died as the bells were ringing on Palm Sunday, April 9 of that year. The differing reactions of American, English, and German publications show very clearly the varying degrees of acceptance and understanding of his music and life at that time. In London it was written, the greatest modern writer for the organ is dead. In Germany, the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik said, in Leipzig he was rather less prominent than in England and America in spite of the great number of his works. 
Cargellert is a chapter with many ramifications and as yet by no means clear. A chapter which then at some future time in German history must be written. With that in mind, we will now look at Cargellert's music for flute. Cargellert was fully aware of the need for concert etudes in order to help prepare flutists for the more modern and complicated orchestral and virtuosic solo repertoire. This forward-looking approach sets him apart from the other composers of flute etudes at that time. The technical challenges in the 30 caprices are many. In particular, there are two aspects to which I would like to draw your attention, the use of flutter tongue and the use of the extreme high register. The 30 caprices represent the first collection of etudes to include flutter tongue, which is used in caprice number 14 and number 20. The earliest examples of flutter tongue in the orchestral repertoire are found in Richard Strauss's Don Quixote, Symphonia Domestica, in Ravel's La Valse, Rite of Spring, Pierrot Lunaire, and Das Lied von der Erde. An example of flutter tongue in Cargellert's music is found in his Impressions as Autiques in the movement entitled Colibri, which means small hummingbird. Flutter tongue, trills, and rapid sixteenth notes played by the piccolo vividly portray a hummingbird. The flutter tongue became widely used in the flute solo repertoire in the 20th century. For example, Boza included flutter tongue in his image for solo flute and in his 14 arabesque etudes. Other compositions among many to use flutter tongue in the solo flute repertoire include Jolivet's Five Incantations and Berio Sequenza. Cargellert knew the improved technical capabilities of the Böhm flute and gave flutists every opportunity for developing technique. The 30 caprices represent the first collection of etudes to include the 4th octave C-sharp and the 4th octave D, used in caprice number 29 and number 30. This C-sharp 4 was used in Strauss's Symphonio Domestica, Salome's Dance, Till Eulenspiegel and Don Juan. Strauss extended the range to D4 in Also Sprach's Zarathustra and Ein Heldenleben. Later in Prokofiev's Classical Symphony, the C-sharp 4 and D4 are both used. Cargellert knew the technical and expressive capabilities of the flute and gave the flutist new opportunities for developing those capabilities. Karl Bartuzot, Cargellert's army friend, colleague, and the flutist to whom the 30 caprices are dedicated, once stated in an article he wrote on contemporary music that, quote, the flute music of Cargellert gives flutists what they are searching for, not only does the music provide technical challenges, it also requires that the flutist be able to interpret the musical content and shape of the music. This music brings the flute, which hasn't been taken seriously lately, into the concert halls and puts it on an equal footing with the string instruments. Cargellert wrote his flute music with honest enthusiasm, and the only wish would be that all flutists who want to improve should try out this groundbreaking music. To his Australian friends, Cargellert mentions that he had no trouble composing, but lacked the time and desire to promote himself to the publishers. His passion seemed to be more in making music, meeting with musicians, and concertizing. In letters between performers of his music in 1926, we read, The evening in his house was charming. Two male friends, Mr. Wiesmann, flautist, and Mr. Schenk, and a lady, all students of him, were there. He and Wiesmann played a gorgeous suite for piano and flute, both instruments demanding a tremendous technique. I admired once more his greatness as a pianist as well as a composer. Later, in 1927, Mr. Wiesmann and Mr. Schenk premiered Cargellert's suite, Impressions as Autiques in Berlin. This five-movement work is dedicated to pianist, close friend, and composer Dr. Walter Niemann, whose home was also the scene of these musical evenings. Flutists know Niemann today mainly for his edition of Quanz's treatise on playing the flute. Mr. Wiesmann also performed Cargellert's Suite Pointillistique with pianist and fellow student Bertha Seifert in 1927. Perhaps the lady student at Cargellert's apartment that evening in 1926 was Bertha Seifert. On a recent visit to Leipzig, I found that many street names are now changed and many homes lie in ruins from World War II, including Niemann's home. 
Bertha's apartment building at 20 Hardenbergstrasse has been beautifully rebuilt and Kargellert Street, Elisenstrasse, no longer exists. When I asked the local residents where I could find Elisenstrasse, the answer was always, Es gibt keine Elisenstrasse. There is no Elisenstrasse. Even the postman hadn't heard of Elisenstrasse. So much has changed. Kargellert was a flamboyant performer and was known to keep a photograph of the composer whose music he was playing on a stand near the organ to provide inspiration during the concert. With mounting excitement during a performance, he stood straight up on the pedals of the organ with his hair standing on end before crashing down on the chords. From a student of his in the 1920s, we read, quote, I just remember one session. He was doing Winterreise by Schubert, and he played the whole of the Winterreise without looking once into the music. He played the whole thing just from memory. That was Kargellert. Kargellert's clothing and demeanor is described in a letter of 1926 between two of his friends. Dark trousers with white narrow stripes, waistcoat and jacket of black velvet with cord embroidery a strawberry-colored, very large, loose silken cravat flowing in the wind. All this crowned by a soft, broad-brimmed felt hat as worn by brigands on the stage. He is not as fat as formerly and has sacrificed his beard, is clean-shaven now, and if I ever said he looks like a beer brewer, I confess I was wrong. His face looks very spiritual. But I was glad, very glad indeed, that I had not to walk with him in this costume in the streets of Berlin or Melbourne. At least I was on the first day. On the second, I had fallen so deeply under the charm of his personality that I had forgotten his outer appearance. Kargellert's spiritual and artistic nature is perhaps best summed up in his own words. Quote, the most beautiful harmony is the harmony of the soul.